She's been waiting for that. You reminded me of that the other day. Turn, if you will, in your Bibles to Zechariah, the third chapter. Zechariah, the third chapter. I want to set just a little bit for you of what's going on here in Zechariah. Now, if you wonder where that is, if you go to Malachi, you're at the last book of the Old Testament, turn left in the back of the book, and you'll be there. So it's the next to last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah, what a, what a book this is. What a, what a challenge it's been. As I said, as, as I was reading and studying, we're, we've been doing this on Wednesday night. And I, I, we got into chapter 3. And I got up and walked around and I sat back down and I started continuing reading. And I thought, Lord, this is wonderful. Did you realize how good this was going to be? And he said, well, yeah, since I wrote it, I really thought that it might be okay. And as I read it, as I got into it, I thought, wow, this is just the people on Sunday morning real can't hear this. And the Lord said, yes, I, I agree. So let me set the stage for you what's going on here. Zechariah. Now Zechariah had a vision. As a matter of fact, he had ten visions. All in one night. Ten visions that God gave him. Now I compared this to Ebenezer Scrooge. You remember Ebenezer, don't you? Remember he had walked home the night after he had had the supper and he saw the face of Ebenezer or Jacob Harley on the door and it scared the jeepers out of him. And he said, well, it must have been the soup or an undigested piece of bread that I had for dinner when I, that, that I saw. He had three spirits visit him in one night. Well, Zechariah has ten visions in one night. And these visions all point in the same direction. You know, the parables that Jesus gave us all point in the same direction. And here we have, as far as Zechariah is concerned, in chapter 3, we have something that is totally and completely uh, almost out of character for Zechariah. But God gave this to him so that you and I on this Sunday morning could fully and completely understand what God is trying to get across to us. Chapter 3, the vision of Joshua and Satan. It's a vision that Joshua had and Joshua, who is the high priest. This is not the Joshua that led the children into the promised land. So this is Joshua, the high priest. Keep this in mind. That Joshua, there's two things here I want you to understand. Joshua, number one, being the priest is representing not only himself, but the nation of Israel. And number two, when a priest goes into the Holy of Holies, when a priest goes in to represent Israel and all of the people, he must wear spotless clothes. He must be spotless, even though we are sinful and have a sinful nature then he must not have a blemish. And that's very important that you understand this. Because as we get into this, look at verse 1. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. A couple of things in this. Number 1. He showed me Joshua the high priest so we know exactly who it is. And he is standing before the angel of the Lord, who is none other than the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, who then has not yet come to this earth, but the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament always represents Jesus Christ. And that is, is that, that's important that you understand that he is standing before Christ. And standing at his right hand, who oh, is our adversary. Satan. And Satan is there to resist him. Satan is there to accuse him. Satan is there to accuse you, ladies and gentlemen and boys and girls and kids. Satan is standing there and he is accusing you before God Almighty every single day. Pointing the finger at God saying, look at that. Just look at that. Wayne Ferry down there pretending to be a preacher. Or look at Roy Matthews or look at all of the others that are teaching something.
Sunday school pretending. And we do not pretend. What we do is we have an advocate in Jesus Christ. And that advocate goes to God Almighty on our behalf. And that's important that you remember that. Because here he is and he is standing here to resist, resist, resist and accuse. And he does a good job. Satan has a job to do. And God gave him that power to do it. God created Lucifer and gave him the power that he has. Look at verse 2 as we get into that. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a grand pluck out of the fire? So the Lord rebukes Satan. Now, I'm not sure if, if the Lord gave me that privilege. I would have been so powerful. I'd probably had a few choice words to say to Satan. I'd have probably really got mad. You ever got mad at somebody and really got into it and afterwards you thought, maybe I shouldn't have done it. Maybe I shouldn't have said it. Maybe I shouldn't have been so harsh. I think we've all been there, haven't we? Oh, yeah. We've all, we, we've all been there where we've probably said something. But once you say it, it's like scrambled eggs. And you can't unscramble them. You can't take them back. They're there. And so here's the Lord. And I think the Lord did this for a very good reason. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. You know why? Because Lucifer is what? He is a created being. Lucifer, the son of the morning. Probably the highest creature that God had ever created. And then sin was found in him. And sin was found in Lucifer. Now, this wasn't the sin of lying. It wasn't the sin of murder or cheating. You know what the sin was? Oh, it's a sin I think God hates the most. And yeah, that's pride. The sin of pride. And it was found in Lucifer. And it was found in, you know what? God made and created every single one of us. The angels, Lucifer, and he gave every single one of us a free will. And Lucifer, in his pride, wanted to take his will above God's will. And he wanted to do things his way and not God's way. You ever done that? Sure we have. Sure we have. Haven't we? Haven't we said, I think I'll do this this way, or I think I'll do it that way, and God knows the way that we should go. God knows our heart, and God knows that he said to Lucifer that thine will that is set above mine shall not stand. And listen, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And specific sins, now listen to this, specific sins like uh, murder, and stealing, and lying, and adultery, they all come under the heading of his own way. And that is the problem we have today, is we do things our way. We want to set ourselves up, and we don't intentionally do it. But I think sometimes we push God away, we push him aside, and we say, we're going to go ahead and do this. And Lord, I want you to put your stamp of approval on it. And when God does not, and we fall on our face and stand our knees, <laughs> he picks us up, dusts us off, and takes the Lord. And sends us on the way. Isn't that great? To have a loving God that loves us so much that he takes us and works and all. Isn't that great that he does that? But this is the problem of mankind. Even the Lord that have chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Now, he's, doing, he's not doing this on the account of Joshua. He is doing this on the account of Jerusalem, the capital of the nation of Israel, his chosen people. God chose Israel. God chose Jerusalem. You think God chose them because they were better? They were stronger? They were more handsome or more nice looking or maybe more well-dressed or more educated? God chose them because God chose them. He's God. He's perfect. He can do what he wants, when he wants, and how much he wants. God chose them. And God said, he said, this is, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? You know what he's telling us here? He's telling us this. That for 70 years, 70 years, Jerusalem lay in ashes, the land fire. Because Nebuchadnezzar came through
through and he would completely destroy Jerusalem. At one time he took 30,000 prisoners back with him. And then he came on two other occasions raiding Israel and the last time totally and completely destroyed it. Took back all of the people or most of them in captivity for 70 years. Jerusalem lay in ruin until God then sent the remnant back to Israel. They rebuilt the wall. They rebuilt the city. And out of the brand of God brought this. And out of the park. And that's what he does every single one of us. Doesn't he? he takes every single one of us. And he plucks us out of the fire, the mud, the mire. And he cleans us up and he sends us home. It's important that you understand that. Because there wasn't any accident that every single person that has accepted Christ in this room, it's not an accident that you know something. God preordained that. And it's very important that you understand how we are as Christians to approach God Almighty. So how are we to approach Him? I'm glad you asked. Look at, look at verse 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. So he's standing before whom? Jesus. And he's standing with filthy garments. Now, as I mentioned, Zechariah is, or Joshua, I mean, is standing before God, representing the nation of Israel also, as well as representing himself. And so, if you, if you really get into this, and if you really read Zechariah, and you read the prophetic books of the Bible, all of them fit together to form the picture that we get. You see, God didn't put all of the prophecies in one book. He didn't put all of the, as we would call them, predictions in one book. What he did is he spaced them out throughout the Bible. We have them in the Old Testament. We have them in the New Testament. About 80% in the Old. And we have in the New Testament then the prophecies of things to come. And the prophecies of what we are to look forward to. In the Old Testament looks forward. The New Testament looks back. All of this to say this, that each and every one of us are high priests. God gave us that as high priests. We are to serve God. We cannot serve Him if we are standing there like Joshua. And how is Joshua standing there? He stood before the angel with what? Filthy garments. Now, Joshua was representing the nation of Israel. And he stood before the high priest. God made a promise to him. God said, I am coming back. And I am coming back to my holy city. I am coming back to my chosen people. And I will be their God. And they will be my people. And I will be in the midst of them. Has not happened yet. But it is going to happen. And God will come back. And he will set up his kingdom on this earth. And Jerusalem will be the capital. And God himself will be there to rule his people. That's a promise. It hasn't happened yet. But it's going to happen. And you feel like I can ask the question, how in the world, God, how can you be so good and so nice to a people that's far from you? That's so far from you. How can you do that? Well, it's like us today, people. We aren't any different than Zechariah in the, the time of his time. We are far away from God. And as long as we are far away from God, all of these things are going to happen to us. I had talked to Patrick and I talked to some of the others uh, less and less before me that uh, he had seen the movie 2016. And I said, we're hoping to have that movie available here in October to show it at the uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church. I hope we can. Patrick said he was sitting in a movie theater and he said all of a sudden, about halfway through, the, the, the alarm goes off. And they have to evacuate the theater. And he also said that speaking with one of the ushers or one of the people there, they said, ah, don't worry about it. If you want to go back in or get your money back, do whatever you want to do. 
But he said, this has happened three times. It's happened every time we show up. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting how Satan works? Isn't that interesting how Satan works through people? And I say interesting because, listen, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Satan is the one created being that was expelled from heaven, that took a third of the angels with him, that promised every single one of us that he was going to be a thorn in our flesh. And if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, he's going to double it. I tell people when I have the privilege of sitting down here and, and leading them to Christ or if they want to join the church, I always take them through the city of prayer. And I tell them this, that Satan's going to come to you in a, two hours, two weeks, two days, whatever. He'll come to you and he'll say, you big phony, you didn't mean that at all. You're just a big phony. But you know what? He's never done that before, has he? Because he had you in his clutches. And now he doesn't have and now he's going to come to you and say, you be phony. Well, you don't want That's true positive that you belong to God, isn't it? Sure it is. Because now he doesn't have you anymore, and he's going to try to ruin your witness. He's going to try to ruin, ruin your fellowship with God. He'll do everything in the world to try to cause you to lose that fellowship. Even throw people in your way, even throw things in your way that you wouldn't even dream of, but he's going to do it. He's going to do it. And I can see some of you sitting out there thinking, he has. He's done that. He has done things to me that I didn't even dream of. But yet you know what God does? He says, I will never leave you, or I will never forsake you, because you're mine. You are sealed until the day of redemption. I love you. And I think the, the explanation to, to this problem is all the way through Zacharias, through these visions, and you really need to read the whole book. You really need to read it to, to find out uh, uh, about the filthy garments, the very dirty garments. And if you recall, that, that we talked about earlier, that the high priest had to dress a certain way. See, they had to, uh, to dress in what they call a twilled garden undergarment. And over that, they would put the beautiful spotless, clean robes that the priest would wear. And Joshua was not, was not, are you, are you listening? Joshua was not a perfect individual. God has never made anybody perfect. You see, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have always existed. How? I don't know. I don't have the foggiest idea. But I accept it. Everything else and everybody else was created. And we fall into that line. And so we're not perfect. I hate to tell you, you're not perfect. God loves you anyway. You know why? Because he made you in his image. And we are to serve him in according to that. But, here comes this thing. Joshua was not perfect. Even though he was the high priest, what did he have? He had filthy, dirty clothes. Now, I don't know if that was, if Joshua was that way all the time or not, but I know this. I know that um, the high priest that represented the people was to be spotless. Let me give you an example. It says, on the day of the Torah, the priest would go into the uh, Holy of Holies for the entire nation issue. That's what they would do. Christ is our high priest. And he is the representative of what we call the corporate body of believers, which is the church. Christ is our go-between. He is our propitiation. He is our go-between between us and God, the Father. Every prayer that we utter goes to Jesus Christ. Every prayer that goes to the Father comes through Him and goes to the Father and Jesus makes it perfect to get to the Father. Isn't that wonderful to know? You can say, well, I, I don't pray very well. I don't do Listen, it doesn't matter how you pray. It matters where it comes from. If it comes from the heart, God will get it. Now, when we look at when we look at all of this, we look at and 
and see what uh, uh, Zachariah is trying to get across to you. I want you to look at verse 4. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away thy filthy, the filthy garments from him, and said unto him, He said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Amen.
When is the last time you went to the Lord and said, Father, in the name of Jesus? You see, if you don't do that, if you don't change your garments, then God's not going to hear you. But go pay attention. He can't. Because he is a holy God. And he cannot fellowship with sin. He cannot hear sin. The only thing that Father can hear from a sinner is when he says, I accept your son. When we then are sealed unto the day of redemption, doesn't mean you're not going to sin. Doesn't mean you're not going to get your, your garments dirty again because you're real. And unfortunately, that's a lot of the problem with our churches today. Is we have pastors, we have a lot of uh, well-meaning people in churches, lots and lots of deacons and Sunday school teachers over this nation. That are trying to do their job in filthy garments. And God will not have it. And He will not hear it. And He will not bless anyone, any church, or anybody that will continue to wear filthy garments. He says, Take them off. Take them off. Remove them from Him. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. And I will clothe thee with change of raiment. <clears throat> but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all that sin and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely, that is, without the law, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Because Christ died for us. He shed His blood for us. That it might be possible that we can come to Him in filthy rags. And Christ will change us. He will make us holy. He will make us right in the eyes. When we stand, I like what this writer says, when we stand clothed in Christ's righteousness, no one, nobody, no created thing can bring any charge against us because we are God's people. Don't you love it? When you are in fellowship with God, the devil cannot stand at the right hand of us when we are standing and sending our prayer to be at the right hand of Jesus. He cannot bring any accusations against us because all Jesus has to do is rebuke them. Devil, Satan, Lucifer, you're rebuked because they're mine. What my Father has given me, I lose none. We have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ because He shed His blood. He clothes us then from the filthy garments, makes them whole and clean. And we stand you know, what, you know what's hard for me to understand? What's hard for me to understand is this. Is that I come to him every day. Every day. Every morning I get up, I say, I, I go to the Lord. Oh, Lord, I'm going to start this out. And I always start it out, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, forgive me. Put clean clothes on me so I can talk. go to his son Jesus Christ who takes my prayer, massages it, makes it whole, makes it perfect, and lays it before the fire. He hears it. I, I turn around the next day, or that night when I come in, I do the same thing and I ask for forgiveness. You know why? Because I want to fellowship with God. I want to fellowship with my Savior. I want him to hear my prayer. And I want to know for certain, down deep in my heart, that when I walked through that line yesterday and I looked in the casket of Russell's mother, lying there, that was her shell. That was her tent. She was with the Lord. There's no doubt in my mind where she is. And I want the same thing. And I 
have to say. Do you? Do you know? Do you know that if you got down on your knees right now, that God would hear your prayer? Do you have filthy rags? Do you have filthy garments on? Listen, there is not a sin that God will not forgive. And I, I had that just, just this last week. Well, Brother Wayne, I, 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 I know that, uh, you know, there, God forgives sin, but does He forgive all sin? Is there a sin that I can commit that He won't forgive? And I said, no, I don't want When Jesus said this, I shed my blood once. I died once. And I have to die twice or three times or four times. Just like you would never be saved three or four or five times. You're saved once. You're sealed until the day of redemption. Boy, you can be like a prophet's son go out and live like a dead man. But God's going to bring you back. He's going to bring you back. He's going to change those clothes if you're that. He has a whole new wardrobe for you. He's, he's standing at the door knocking and saying, I've got this word just for you. I've got to change your heart just for you. But I think sometimes we think we let the Lord down and the Lord doesn't want to use us and the Lord doesn't want to claim us. That's not true. That's, that's straight from hell. The Lord says, I love you because I made you in my image and no one or nobody will take you from me. me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for those who are here this morning. As I <clears throat> thought about this message this morning, I thought, Lord, but there's going to be a lot of people gone today. And the Lord said, wait, it doesn't matter if there's ten or a thousand. This is what I need in this day. Someone here needed to hear this message this morning. And it didn't come from Wayne, it came from the Lord. He just uses me. I'm no better or no worse than anybody else. I am a hell-bound sinner for the grace of God. And he stands at the door with a brand new word for somebody in this room. Wouldn't you love to be able to know that when you walk out of this room, when you walk out of this church, that you're a brand new person? Then you can say, well, I am. I've been saved. And he hasn't been born of me. Let's change it. Let's make things right with God right now. So that you know for certain that God will hear you. Right? There's only one way to do it. And that is to ask for forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. And he will do that. <coughs> he will change your wardrobe. He will change your clothes. And he will make you whole and perfect to stand before uh, God Almighty. Doesn't mean that you're not going to sin. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have uh, probably some hard times yet to come. What it means is this. Is that the world can go to hell in a hand. God said, I will take care of you today. I will give you food. I will give you shelter. And I will give you clothing. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. It has not problems. That's just Concentrate on today. Let him close you. Let him change you. This church needs some help. This church needs people to volunteer to do things. This church needs people to help on Wednesday night. This church needs help on um, Sunday night. This church is God's church. And it's not one asking, it's God asking. Change your garments. Serve God in a way that the joy and the peace will go beyond all understanding because the filthy rags that we have and that we've done in our own self will be changed. It's all up to you whether or not you want that. Oh, Father, there's people here today that need to join this church. There's people here today that need to get down on their knees and say thank you. There's people here today that would say, I would like to serve this church in some way.
tonight at a quarter to six, we're going to have our latest prayer meeting. I pray that we'll have it in the altar to where everybody can come and join at the altar and get down on our knees at the altar and have a good old-fashioned uh, prayer time. It'll only take about 15 minutes. <coughs> we're going to do that just tonight. And I would love to see this church filled. I'm not asking for me. Joshua wasn't asking for himself. He was asking for his people. And I'm not asking for myself. I'm asking for God's people to stand up and to be counted and to go forward in new garments with a new order and new fellowship. For more information, visit our website at mountzionozark.weebly.com. And thank you for watching. We would love the opportunity to meet you and get to know you better. Feel free to come visit during one of our services. Have a blessed day.